my name is Mike DeWitt, and today I'm going to be talking with you about building WordPress themes with modular SaaS. I'm visiting here today from Boston, Massachusetts, to where I live and work. I work at a company called Buildium, which is a software company in Boston, and we make software for property managers. We make uh, software that helps them automate their accounting, their doing their taxes, marketing their listings, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we make software that makes them get that stuff done faster. I work as a front end developer there. I worked a lot on the marketing team when I first started, which involved working on our WordPress site, buildium.com, which is our marketing site, which is how we get people into the sales funnel. Um, right now I'm doing a little bit more front end, general front end development within our core application, a little bit less WordPress. And prior to that, I worked at a very large digital content marketing agency in Boston. While I was there, I worked on that company's marketing site, uh, which was a very old legacy theme, probably five or six years old. And it had all of its styles in theme. one single style, that SCSS file, in the root of the theme, which we're all used to. That's the way that we learn WordPress. We put our styles in style. Styles.scss, or styles.css. Um, and it was probably eight or 9,000 lines of very unorganized, messy, unstandardized CSS code. So whenever you had to go in and try and fix something or add something, it was a nightmare. More, to, more often than not, you would fix something on another page without realizing it. And it was a nightmare to work on. I hated working on it. I hated CSS. Uh, so. I got the privilege to actually redo the site myself. And I was looking around for starter themes, something that would get me started right off the bat um, uh, with basic WordPress theme structure. So I was looking around and just Googling around the community, I found uh, a theme called Bones. Now, Bones does things a little bit differently. There is nothing in styles.css. Bones, along with a couple other themes that I want to put on your radar, called Sage and Underscores, which is maintained by Automatic. These themes use a concept <laughs> called modular SAS. They don't use CSS as we typically first learn it. So we have this idea, modular SAS. What does that even mean at a high level? What is modular? Modular to me is taking something that's extremely large like that 8,000 line CSS file and breaking it down into small, reusable, and maintainable components. You know, programming languages have features like this built in. We have things like classes in PHP, we have variables and loops, and things that help us prevent repetition. You know, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got about programming was if you're repeating yourself, whether it's within a single project or from project to project, you need to think about why and don't repeat yourself. Ask the question, why am I repeating myself? And is there any possible way that I can automate it? Because there are. There are so many ways that you can automate everything that you do. And if you're writing plain old CSS, you're going to be repeating yourself a lot, especially when you're scaling that CSS. So some very smart people already thought about this problem and developed a system to make it better. And that's where SAS comes in. So SAS stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets, and it was developed in the mid-2000s by a man named Hampton Catlin. You should check him out on Twitter. He's a great guy. Does some really interesting work. And SAS brings some of these components that I mentioned that make programming easier and brings them into CSS so we can write less code and do more and just do it faster. Wow. Write less. So I've done this talk at a couple different WordCamps. And I tend to get audience, some people have absolutely no experience with SAS and want to learn the basics. So I'm going to cover some of the basics of what you can do with SAS. And if you've already worked with SAS, you're already really familiar with it, I want to cover uh, some more advanced cases and talk a little bit more about build tools so you can really automate both your workflow and your deployment of, of CSS. So I talked about some of my favorite features of SAS. Nesting. You can nest selectors in SAS. So here we have a very basic example. We have a container called pricing page and then a link. And then I'm applying styles to that Get right there, text decoration. And then we have a little bit of different syntax uh, that you won't see in traditional CSS. There's an ampersand and that is actually appending that element to its parent. In this case, it's a pseudo element, but you can also do it with regular elements. And that is compiled 
uh, to look like this. So right here, we've already saved ourselves from writing the container class uh, multiple times. We only write it once. We namespace our styles, and it gets applied in both places. So you can think about that at scale. You end up writing a lot less. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> so important distinction to make here is that if you get into the SAS community to already work with SAS extensively, and you maybe start looking through GitHub at, at some projects with implementing SAS, you're going to come across two different types of syntaxes. One file name is called .scss, and that's the syntax that I just showed you. But there's an alternative syntax called .sass. And it's the same exact thing. We're still talking about SAS, and all the functionality that I'm talking about can be applied. But it has a different syntax in the vein of Ruby and Python, where everything is tabbed and spaced. And there are no brackets or semicolons. So you can see here that I'm basically the same exact thing. It looks a little bit foreign if you're used to CSS, but it gets compiled in the exact same way. So I want to make that distinction. Um, and I think if you're coming from a background of CSS and from PHP and JavaScript, those types of languages, you can be more comfortable with SCSS. And that's what I'm going to show from, from now. But I just want to make that distinction to clear up any confusion. So nesting is great. Uh, nesting is a great feature. But nesting unchecked can be even more harmful than not having nesting at all. So you have to be very careful of over nesting your selectors. If you start to get five, six levels deep, first of all, you're creating more specificity in your CSS. And specificity in CSS is the most dangerous thing at scale. Because some, if you have a very specific selector for an element, in order to override that, you have to make one even more specific, and so on and so forth. And we've all got into that hell where we're writing extremely long selectors or even using the important tag, which is, you know, we've seen those types of CSS files where there are importants everywhere. We want to avoid that. So I think if you're working on an individual project, maybe just you or another developer, I think two to three levels deep nesting is ideal. Don't necessarily make your nesting look exactly like your HTML. You want to nest that deep. Now, if you're working on a really large project, and this is something we've been working on at Buildium, so we actually use less, as somebody pointed out, which is an alternative to SAS. It's another CSS preprocessor. And we, we were in nesting hell. It was incredibly hard to make changes to our less code. So we've adopted an approach of using no nesting and using something called BEM, which is, stands for Block Element Modifier. Uh, I could probably give a talk on how BEM works separately, but it's definitely something to follow up on. It's just a, a, a methodology of writing classes, and it really helps reduce specificity. It hey it's easier to, to make changes. Specificity in CSS is, is, an, is your enemy. So another great feature of SAS, variables. Here I'm going to declare, this is the syntax for declaring uh, variables. And in this case, I'm using colors. And I love this because I hate working with text values. They mean nothing to me semantically. If I'm looking at hashtag 00F, that doesn't mean anything to me. I have to look it up and like, oh, is that blue? Is that, is that green? I don't know what that means. So this, if you have three or four core brand colors, you can create your variables at the top of your file and then use them throughout, and it's easy. So in this case, I'm, I'm kind of building off the example that I showed before. Um, and just like in a programming language, once you've declared a variable, you can define another variable with it. So that's what we're doing here. Um, uh, declaring our link color variable as is blue. And it works. You can see how it's compiled. Uh, it's much cleaner and easier to maintain, in my opinion. So this gets into a theme that I want to I want to hit hard and that I want you to take away from this talk is that this a system like this lets you change something once and you change it everywhere. And that is a huge benefit over traditional CSS. And a great example of that is colors. You could change that color variable. Say the designer comes back to you and says, OK, we want to lighten this shade slightly. We're going to use this hex value for blue. You can change it once in your variables file. And boom, it's changed throughout your entire project. You don't have to worry about it anymore. So easy. Now, variables get very advanced in SAS. And people do some pretty sophisticated things. 
One programming concept that's found its way into SAS is called interpolation, which you'll see in a lot of back-end programming languages, including PHP. So I'm going to build a four-column grid here using SAS. So I've declared a variable called column, and then we can use a loop. And yes, you can use all the different kinds of loops, like in this case a for loop, while loop, for each loops. You can use those in SAS. So I'm doing a little math here. I'm writing my loop, and then this is the interpolation syntax. So you have a hashtag, and then the variable is surrounded uh, by brackets. So in this case, we want to return the width is 100 divided by our number of columns. So in that case, that's always going to be 25. We're going to multiply that by our iteration. So the first iteration, we're going to have 25, 50, 75, and so on. And then we're going to turn that into a percent by multiplying it by 1%. Simple enough. So we've written one, you know, four, line, uh, four lines of code and a simple variable declaration will output this four column grid. And you can see that the iteration, the i variable, was, was interpolated uh, each time through. And if you just look up, if you do some good Google searches on advanced SAS, you'll see people doing stuff like this, writing very complex uh, loops, conditionals, and things like that to build things, very, build, build complex systems very easily. Whereas you would have to do so much manual calculation in traditional CSS. Just let, let, let the programming language do it for you. So it can get even more advanced than this. And I added this at the last minute, and I didn't put an example. But let's, let's, let's talk about what SAS maps are. And if you do a Google search, again, you'll see a few articles right off the bat are, are really great at describing this. But instead of having this static variable uh, columns, we can actually create objects in SAS. So we can create a key value pair, um, and let's say, let's say you want the key to be a color, a, a color name, and then the value to be a hex. Then you can iterate through that and create, uh, create classes and CSS properties out of the keys and values uh, by using a loop. So it's a really powerful tool. Uh, definitely check out, check out some articles on, on Google um, isn't this, sorry, SAS maps. Yeah, no, that's exactly the case. And then so, th there's some people in the JavaScript community that believe very strongly using a programming uh, framework called React that you can actually substitute all, all CSS um, with, with, uh, with JavaScript and, and do all these things that you can do. But you can't, it's, it's like a separation of concerns, though. When you write, when you're using SAS, it's something that's reserved for your style. So it makes it really clean and easy to use. Technically, of course, you can do this all, all in JavaScript, yeah. but it's, this is something that happens um, before, you know, before runtime. This is something that you compile. And I'm going to talk a lot about compiling uh, at the end of this talk. But if you're interested in that, check out React inline styles. If you do a Google for that, you'll see some really cool stuff. We great talk by Christopher Chadeau, who's on the React team, who believes very strongly about this. And there are definitely people who are shipping code that write zero CSS and do it all in, in React with okay. inline styles. Okay. One more very important concept, mix-ins. So, gradient, right? Tons of entry prefixes and tons of ugly syntax. So, in this case, I'm going to make what's called a mix-in for my CSS gradient. And this is what that syntax looks like. I'm going to declare it by using at mixin, this keyword. And then I'm going to give it a name, CSS gradient. Then I'm going to give it two arguments and their default setting. And then you can see that to and from are, are substituted in the appropriate places throughout the mixin. And now, I never have to write a CSS gradient ever again. I can simply include it using this syntax, at include, CSS gradient, and then two arguments. And in that case, I'm using two color variables that I've already declared. And when that's compiled, you can see you have all this mess. What if you want to change the, the, um, the second argument there and make, make the shade that you're going to a little bit darker? You'd have to change that in one, two, three, four, five places. And now you just do it once. Change it once and change it everywhere. Mixins are, are the most modular component of SAS. So much so that people make entire libraries of mixins that you can import into your project and use. One such implementation is called Bourbon. Uh, it's definitely worth checking out. 
But um, and Bourbon is really great at not only limiting some of the syntactic CSS gradients, but it's really, really good at getting vendor prefix coverage on all your code. So Bourbon, the, the people who develop Bourbon are, are writing these mix-ins and paying attention to which vendor prefixes are needed and which ones are supported. So definitely check something to check out Bourbon. Uh, it's a mix-in library for SAS. All right, SAS also includes functions. Not only can you declare your own functions, but you can use, SAS has a nice suite of built-in functions. So I'm taking that example that I just showed you, button, and I'm including my mix-in that I declared. And I'm using orange for the first argument, but for the second argument, I'm using SAS's built-in darken function. And that takes two arguments. It takes that's supposed to be a dollar sign orange. That's a typo right there. That's uh, a color variable, and then um, the amount by which I would right. darken it by. Looks very similar to any programming language, right? All our favorite programming languages have built-in APIs with arguments, and we can use them. So dollar sign orange, we're going to darken it by 10%, and that will generate a new hex value for you when it's compiled. Right. So what if you wanted to tweak that? What if you want to make it 12%, 15%? You can do that in a matter of seconds and recompile your CSS uh, without, without having to rewrite gradients over and over again. And this kind of also illustrates that we're really tying together several features of SAS. We're tying together mix-ins, variables, and functions. So, sorry, Mike, I have a question here for you. Sure. Uh, I believe it would probably fail. Fail? Yeah. yeah. Okay, second question. I got a SAS, well, I got a CSS uh, file um, that I had to look into, and it had a bunch of comments. When I was looking at the comments, I was making a reference to the SAS pre-compiled line numbers of where to look into, so I suspect, and, and tell me how you, this is your challenge too, how would you find the original source code to find out what the hell gave it that, that is a value? great question, because um, I'm going to talk about source maps. Uh, at the end of this talk, and Bones actually has a built-in functionality for that. I'm going to get to that, and then, and there are ways to solve that problem because it does get does get hairy. You want to know where something came from. All right, extends. So we're going to see a little bit of new syntax here. We're going to see percentage sign button. What does that mean? Well, in SAS, I can actually declare some styles that aren't being applied to any class. So this is just an arbitrary, some arbitrary styles that then I can, using this extend keyword, apply to a new class. So that'll take everything that's in here, put it in here, and then I can add my own custom I overrides. And not only can you just create arbitrary, uh, arbitrary modules, you can also just extend classes the themselves. So this could be dot button, and then you could extend dot button, and then apply your own custom overrides. So create a module and modify it. All right, one more for you guys. We're going to talk about import. So this is taken directly from uh, Bones' main style.scss file. And when you open up that file, all you're going to see are imports. And if you look at these files, you're going to see that we've modularized all these different features into separate components and then are importing them at the top of our style sheet. So we have one specifically just for mixins. So that helps, to your point, that helps if you, you know, it might not help you retrospectively, but if you're organizing your code for the first time, try and keep a separation of concerns. Keep your mixins in one file. Functions are in their own file. We have one specifically for typography. We have one specifically for variables. Now, what happens next at the bottom of this file? There are more imports. Now, this differs a bit between Bones and Sage and underscores. They deal with this in their own way. But I really like Bones because it uses breakpoint includes. So look, let's look at this logic here. We're just writing a standard media query. But then, if, if we meet those parameters of that media query, we import a specific file uh, that was designated to, to be applied at that breakpoint. So we have one called base.scss that is applied to all devices. Then if we want to make a modification for over a landscape mobile, we import 481 up, and so on and so forth through our uh, various device breakpoints. 
So this is really great. I really like this because when I was redoing that theme at the digital agency, I never had to write a media query, which was amazing, right? Media queries are very verbose. And it can get disorganized very quick. Um, so it's a great way to do it. So this is what main.scss looks like in the Bones theme file structure. So you're going to have a lot of files, which at first can seem kind of overwhelming. It's like if you're used to one file, it's like where is it coming from? What, what's going on here? I think if you spend a little bit of time with it, if you spend three or four days hacking with this, you'll find that it makes things so much easier because all those files are very small. And if you can't remember exactly where it came from, you at least have a frame of reference. It's not just all stuff in one file. All right, so we have a challenge. Can browsers read .scss or .sass files? No, they can't. So I think one of the biggest hurdles for me when I was first getting started with this is that you have somehow have to put a build step into your workflow. You have to compile what I've showed you, all these SAS features, you have to compile them into standard CSS that our browser can understand. So I want to talk about a few ways that I've done it. There are plenty more, and people can definitely chime in with their preferred methods. Um, so if you're, if you're new to SAS, and you're new to maybe front-end build tools, uh, I think my preferred tool is a plugin called WPSCSS, which I've made a few contributions to. And that is a, a WordPress plugin, and you install it. And you simply, there are very simple configura configuration options. You have the path to your SCSS, and then the path that you would like it compiled to, the compiled CSS. And this runs whenever you refresh your site. It uses a PHP compiler to, to generate the CSS code. It has a few limitations, though. If you're super concerned with performance on your site, you don't want to add additional plugins when you don't have to. Furthermore, some of the features that I've mentioned actually won't work with this plugin. I know I've used, I've tried to use interpolation, which is that, uh, you know, substituting in a variable into a string, and that has not worked with WP SCSS. So that's just something to keep in mind. But I think if you're looking to just get started, download Bones and download WP SCSS and get started that way. It's a great way to get started. <coughs> So SAS, at the end of the day, is, is a Ruby gem. It, and if you're a Mac user, you have the Ruby programming language already installed on your computer by default. So you can simply install a gem. Gems are like the module systems, system of Ruby. Plugins are to WordPress as gems are to Ruby. So you can simply install a gem to extend the functionality of Ruby. And then that'll open up a keyword on your command line, SAS. You can do SAS, and then I forget what the arguments are, but that will, that will run the native Ruby compiler of SAS. Now, there's one more tool, which is also a Ruby gem that depends on SAS, called Compass. And Compass is, if we think of Bourbon, which I mentioned before, which is also a Ruby gem natively, Compa uh, uh, Bourbon is, is like a, uh, a, a library. And, and Compass is more of a framework. It's a little bit more robust in its functionality. Now, to your question, um, there's one Ruby file in the Bones theme, if you look at the, the Git repository, and it's called config.rb, and that is in the root of the SCSS directory. If you open up that file, you'll see that it is a compass configuration file. And out of the box, what, what the theme developer has decided is to turn on source maps. So in your compiled CSS, it will say specifically, this came from line this from file this. It will say specifically. And with some of these other build tools, you also have the possibility of creating source maps. And that's the way that not only, uh, um, uh, you know, front-end developers or SaaS developers work. I mean, that's also something that's true in the JavaScript community. Uh, when you're, when you're minifying, minifying and compiling code, you want to know exactly where certain things came from. Otherwise, it can get really confusing. I mean, 
I don't believe so. I mean, Compass, right. I know Compass has like a GUI editor, yeah. so we might be talking about the same thing, but. Um, but you would run this Compass on the command line? Yes, the, the, the most native interface, I mean, the, the native interface is the command line interface. So you run it in the same way you run Compass, and then, you know, the path to your, to your SCSS directory. So we need to, you need to have it installed on your server? I'm, I'm missing so we can talk a little bit about that if, if you, if you are interested. Um, so let's, let's say you're developing a website locally, right? That's the way that we start off. You're doing it on localhost. You can install these build tools and run them however you'd like. But you're right. When you deploy the code, you have to somehow do that on your server, right? Because otherwise it's not going to be compiled. And you don't want to include this in source control, for sure. But let's say you are using source control, something like git. So you would git ignore the compiled CSS. You never ever want to include build, like uh, built um, or compiled code in, in your git repository. So one way that I would do this is to, yes, install SAS or install Compass or install these next two tools that I'm going to talk about, Gulp or Grunt, and install them on your staging and, and production servers. And then what you can do, Git has a really good system of hooks. So you can say, when, when pushed, execute these, you basically write a shell script to do these commands and compile your code. Um, does that make sense? Well, just in general, a lot of time you inherit a server, it's not something you have control over, like the client server or you're part of the server. Yeah, so I would definitely recommend then like using the plugin. I mean, that's a great, it's a great tool. Um, so the final two, two build tools that I want to talk about are, uh, are Gulp and Grunt. And if you look at Sage on GitHub, Sage has a, has a very sophisticated, robust Gulp workflow. And both of these tools run on no. Node.js. They're, they're front-end tools that you run uh, that do a variety of tasks. They do SAS compilation. They do JavaScript minification. They do image minification. There are literally hundreds of tasks that you can integrate into your flow. Um, so in the same case, you would, you would have to have these installed on your uh, staging or production server and then have some sort of trigger when, when the code is pushed uh, through source control, run these commands and have it compile. So, you know, I think that's all I got. Um, but I, I just wanted to open up for questions. I don't know what time is it. Wow, that went by fast. All right, then let's talk about questions. If anybody has any comments to follow up with, with anything that I talked about, um, please feel free. Do you mind giving maybe like a generic set of questions and what you've already had a website you want to use it for? Mm-hmm. 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 Do you have to install it on the server? Like, how would you just compile the code here? Do you want to log it? It gives you a different There you yeah. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that and then, you know, if you want to use FTP, you can do that and take take just the copied file and, and publish it. Um, yeah. The, the final exactly. Yeah. It just gets more complicated. Like if you're trying to work with other developers, there are gonna be conflicts with your compiled compiled code. Um, so you just want to be careful with that. Uh, any other questions or the last reference you made regarding Sage to Gulf or Grunt. Uh-huh. Sage is, a, is another theme, a WordPress starter theme. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's on GitHub. Check it out. All three of those that I mentioned, uh, Bones, um, underscores. yeah, Underscores and Sage are all just different WordPress themes that use some version of what <coughs> I've talked about. But uh, has Gulp built in? Sage does, yes. Okay. So you have to download the theme, you have to have Gulp installed, and you have to run Gulp and build the site for it to work the first time you use it. Yeah. Uh, it basically does the same stuff that Gulp and, and Grunt do, but it's purely a UI. <coughs> if, you're, if you're command line phobic, um, you can use that. There's also a good one if you're a Windows user. There's one, it's actually totally free. It's called Koala, if you happen to use. Uh, that's, how I, that's how I also got started, just building some of these things locally. Um, it's totally free, and it's a good tool. Some more questions? or. Sure. Uh, less, yeah, we actually write less at Buildium. That's our preprocessor. Um, one of the main 
So, so you have any My questions? Question maybe is, like okay. verses. Because I usually work with Red, mm -hmm. and I've seen forums, people talking about that it's better to this and that. But really, if you're just doing, unless you're looking for mixins, which you can always get from for Red. You could write mixins in less, yeah. So in that case, it really is a difference. I think it so comes down to your preference. I think some of the more advanced features, like I was talking about SAS maps which uh, you basically create objects in SAS and then are able to iterate over them. I'm not sure that that's possible unless so some really advanced features like that. Um, I also feel personally like the development community behind SAS and the features that are being developed for SAS are moving more rapidly. Um, there's a really interesting project that's worth checking out called LibSAS. And that natively, the SAS compiler is in Ruby. But LibSAS, they're actually developing a C and C++ compiler of of, uh, of uh, SAS, which is like, you know, about 10 times faster than the native Ruby compiler. And it also has, uh, it also removes the Ruby dependency from your site. And in, case, uh, in the case of if you're comparing it to less, it removes the, the, the less dependency, I guess, less the JavaScript module that you use. Um, so for example, if you, were, if you had a, a team that was working on Windows and you, uh, if you used Gulp, or I'm sorry, if you use Grunt or Gulp, uh, you actually use Node bindings to LibSAS to build. You don't use any Ruby dependency. So there's just things like that, like that that are going on in the community that are worth checking out that I think are moving SAS in a more, uh, in, a, in a more futuristic direction, <laughs> uh, in a way that. Yeah, Bootstrap has also decided to, to make everything. I believe they had everything in less, and now they've moved it all to SAS. So it's just, um, I see features coming out faster, and I see things being developed. I think you're right. For things like I've talked about, nesting, mixins, uh, variables, all that stuff is, is, is rich in, in the less community. So uh, you won't miss out on that. So if, if you've inherited a site that doesn't use SAS or less, or you're, you've got a theme that doesn't use SAS or less, how do you get into You SAS can start off by changing all the files uh, from CSS to <coughs> .scss. It'll work perfectly fine. So the one way you could start is nope. by changing the file names and then putting in that build step and making sure it compiles to a CSS file. And then you're going to have to start doing a lot of refactoring if you want to start using these features. So there's nothing that takes CSS and sort of starts. I've to tried. Along. I've tried. There are like some tools that do it, but all the like all of them have just resulted in broken yeah. code. It's tough. Engineer. It's tough to reverse engineer. Um, but I think I think if you if you really were committed to it, depending on how bad the CSS is of this theme, you know, if it's relatively well organized, you know, you you might be able to do it. You might be able to just start with color variables, right? If you're sick of remembering hex, and you can you don't have to, you know go ahead and write all these elaborate mixins. You can use the, the bare bones features of SAS. It's not costing you anything, right? Because we're building the CSS before. It's not costing you any performance. It's totally. You need a compiler on the server. I mean, that that yeah, but it's built before the, the anybody reaches it. So all they're hitting are CSS files. It's, it's the same exact thing as, it's just a tool for developers. It's not, it has absolutely no impact on, on, the, on the client experience, so. Any more questions or? Ah. I guess I don't really need to keep this up, but for aesthetic. Um, I like using like a library like Bourbon or writing. You know, I think at Buildium we just have mixins for all the that we've written that we've handwritten. Um, have you tried Bourbon before? Yeah, that's a great one. And that's Bourbon, I mean, that's the main reason that it exists is for vendor prefixes and for keeping things maintained across all the browsers. Um, so that's definitely worth checking out. And I know I've never used auto prefix or like the, the build tool before, but. Um, um, an option is Bookkit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, cool. So yeah, that's, that's definitely an alternative to like, if you don't want to import another library or mess with, mm -hmm. with Bourbon, definitely check out. There's, there's also auto prefixer tools, not only for CodeKit, but also for Gulp and Grunt. No worries. In terms of capacity at uh, Buildium, what compiler, what workflow do you use like for as far as compiling of the four or five that? Like what's your go-to? We use Grunt. Uh, yeah, we use Grunt for everything. We have a lot of, like our build takes two or three minutes because just a lot of stuff. And, um, and yeah, we're using less, so it's not, you know, 
it's not as sexy as this, but you know, um, <laughs> and like I said, we've worked really hard in, in making it our less easier. And I mean, we're not really using a ton of these crazy features. We want to reduce nesting. We want to keep variables simple and semantic. Um, but even using those very basic features makes your life easier, in my opinion. Any more questions? Or, oh, uh, got one right here. Working with, like, working with a team and, you know, like, version, version control when it comes to this, you know, stats and, um, like, locally compiled um, things. Because, you know, they always say, like, well, don't push the source and all that. Yeah. GitHub or whatever. But how do you get around that and still have control? Yeah, so if we get ignore all anything that's compiled. So. We have, I mean, we have a lot of stuff that is compiled. We use something called Browserify for JavaScript dependencies, which is a very large build step. And then we also use less compiler and some other things. And we don't commit any of that. It goes in a dist folder. A dist, you know, we, have a, we have a specific folder for, for everything that's built. And then that is just get ignored. So if you are pulling down the repository for the first time, and this is the case with Sage as well. If you look at Sage, um, they're not including any of the build inside of their Git repository. And then when you receive it for the first time, assuming you have Grunt and Gulp installed, you just run Grunt build or whatever task they have deemed to. And then that creates the folder for you and it's never committed no matter what the changes are. It's not, it's not recognized or seen by Git. So, so is there a way to actually have, because I actually have an auto deploy to GitHub uh -huh. to you know, just my distribute you know, folder of my team. Um, but is there a way to actually break that into a new I'm not sure. Like, if you're, it depends. Are you are you working alone, or you are working with I'm a team? I'm working alone, but I, I'm, I'm trying. I mean, to when I worked, process. when I worked alone, I had no problem committing mm -hmm. compiled stuff. You know, that's never going to be a problem. It, the The problem comes if you're having multiple people who are ma who are making changes. You're going to get like really bad merge conflicts that you yeah. can't fix. So there's no problem. I mean, I can't think of a a way besides like writing a Git hook yeah. um, to compile it, then you have to have server access, obviously, to your deployment environment, but, you know. Seems like it gets kind of complicated, and that wasn't my intention of talking about SAS, but that's why I love the WordPress plugin, because it's just like, mm -hmm. does it. If you're not using version control, you might as well just stick with the WordPress plugin, and it's, you know, you still get the benefits. So, more questions, concerns, comments? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so Okay. <anyway. laughs> All right, well thank you so much guys. Had a great time and uh yeah, thank you. Thank you.